Historians call this rapid growth of cities in southern Mesopotamia between the years 4000 to 3100 BC the Uruk phenomenon. A people whose real origin is unknown may have entered into the region and mixed with the local Ubaid population. What the Ubaidians called them is anyone's guess. They, however, would call themselves Sagiga, meaning the black-headed people. Before the Sumerians, the Natufians were the inhabitants of the Levant. Right after the warming of the climate that followed the younger Dryas, the Natufians were the ones who developed the first known civilization. They were also the first to develop agriculture, and increasingly research is showing that they were the builders of Gobekli Tepe. When Dr. Loring Brace from the University of Michigan performed a proximity analysis of the Natufian language, they discovered that the Natufian language is more closely related to one particular language family, the Niger-Congo language family. True knowledge comes from the upward path that leads to the fire eternal. Misattributed as a Levantine or European civilization, there is now a large and unmistakable body of evidence that shows that early Mesopotamia was an African civilization. Early periods in the Levant bears its culture, its religion, and its genetics. But it isn't its cultural origin that mainstream historians have mistakenly popularized, but its venerated title as Cradle of Civilization. And the evidence that shows that this latest instance of modernization of the world started with the Africans from the nubio kemetic civilization complex is numerous. And this evidence goes back to the early days of recorded history, well before the severe climate change that caused the decline of the African-led Sumer and Akkad, and introduced the Levantine stock from the Guchian rule of Lagash in the latter declining periods of Sumer. From the invention of the wheel, to the famous epics of Gilgamesh, to urbanization, agriculture, mathematics, modern time-tellings, and other sciences. We will see how one group of Africans in Kemet sparked civilization in another group of black Africans in Sumer for millennia. And we will deconstruct that all-too-popular erroneous saying that Mesopotamia is the cradle of civilization. This is the Without History Channel. Every episode, we bring salient facts about African ancient civilizations in history and detail how these ancient civilizations set the foundation of our modern world. We dive deep into what research reveals about the often overlooked and misattributed contributions about these key eras in our collective history. This channel would not exist without the invaluable support of our benefactors. Every contribution, no matter how small, helps us eradicate ignorance of our history. You can find various ways to support us in the video description. You will also find a multitude of sources for those that like to dive deeper into these subjects. But for now, let's see then who really started civilization. We keep hearing this pretty much everywhere, that Mesopotamia started before ancient Egypt, Kemet. So much so that it is almost taken as a fact by much of the population today. But what does the evidence show about these two civilization complexes? Who started first? This is of course of great importance when trying to establish where the foundations of our modern civilization began. Where did writing come from? Who built the first settlements? Who were the first to institute science and mathematics? And who were the ones to spread their inventions, knowledge and know-how that ultimately was inherited by pretty much every civilization of ancient times. No feeling, not preferences, but pure evidence. As we go through the evidence, you will see that historians have conveniently or deliberately muddied the narrative in such a way that the nubio kemetic civilization, better known as ancient Egypt, isn't attributed the title of first and most influential civilization. Probably because the implications, as we shall see, are startling. Stick to the end where we also reveal a very interesting fact about the origin of Sumer itself. But we begin with the origin of the most influential invention that historians agree has impacted civilization the most. Before we talk about Egyptians and Mesopotamian writing origins, I will briefly mention that there are at least two writing systems that have been discovered in Africa that predate hieroglyphics and cuneiform by at least a millennia. 
and that's in Sibidi, and the Proto-Saharan script, which dates back to a staggering 5000 BC, the first heavily used in the Sahara when it was lush and peopled by black people, and the second hails from the region of Nubia. These are often ignored, and thus not known by the general population. But let's go back to Egypt and Sumer. Oh, by the way, there are always a few gems that we leave at the end of our videos. Extensive research has been done on the subject of the origin of writing. Dr. Gunter Dreyer clearly shows that the early hieroglyphics were at least centuries older than any of the proto-forms of cuneiform from Mesopotamia. And how is he so sure? Multiple items recovered from the tomb UJ, where the pallets were recovered, have been carbon dated to 3400 BC. Items such as linen, this makes them at least a century older than any early form of writing in Mesopotamia. Dr. Gunter Dreyer of the German Institute of Archaeology is perhaps the most prominent of a number of archaeologists who showed that writing actually developed out of early marks that were used to tally the kinds and amounts of goods in stock at ancient warehouses. Dr. Dreyer recently discovered numerous inscribed bone labels attached to bags of oil and linen in the tomb of King Scorpion I at Abydos, Egypt. The labels date back 5,300 years, are the world's earliest known writing, and describe inventory owners, amounts, and suppliers. To get a good measure of Dr. Dreyer, here is a quote from one of his interviews. And I quote, In Germany and in many other countries, you study philology, hieroglyphs, writing, texts, inscriptions, but you cannot really study archaeology. You can learn about some monuments, but to study archaeology, you must go to the field. You must work in an excavation. The best training you can get in Europe is with the prehistorians who work in Europe, and they don't have big temples." End quote. This is well known in academia, but seldom talked about, causing people to continue believing in the fallacy that Mesopotamia was the cradle of civilization. If anything, Given the dates and the direction of propagation of civilization, it is more logical to conclude that the Mesopotamian writing system, along with their civilization, were in fact heavily influenced by the Africans from the Nubio-Kemetic civilization. And we will see that in more details later on. In fact, this is attested to by none other than the famous Greek historian Diodorus of Siculus, who wrote in his Bibliotheca Historica that, quote, they affirm that the Chaldeans in Babylon are Egyptian colonies, and that their astrology have attained to that degree of reputation by the knowledge they have learned of the Egyptian priest. End quote. Well then, what now of the statement that Mesopotamia was first in writing? By now the damage has already been done, in a similar fashion that follows the belief that Egypt wasn't black African. It is believed by archaeologists that writing arose out of increasing complexity deriving from organization of large populations generally found in city-states and large civilization complexes, but it doesn't stop at writing. The Africans also pioneered key theological concepts first. Knowing when and where the first settlements and concentration of population occurred is crucial as it will tell us where organized social, economical, and political structures first arose. The classical ancient Egyptian history begins when King Narmer unified Upper and Lower Egypt. See King Narmer's statue here and this awesome reconstruction of King Narmer from King Monologue and Mr. Imhotep. But in truth, Narmer wasn't the first African king of the Nubio-Kemetic civilization complex. All along the Nile, well before Narmer, there was already a vibrant set of densely populated centers. Narmer was the first king to unite the two lands of Upper and Lower Egypt, securing the coveted title of Nebtawi, translating to Lord of the Two Lands. These independent kingdoms were nourished by the silt of the generous Nile and these communities existed all the way back from 5,500 B.C. to 3,100 B.C. And Egyptologists call it the pre-dynastic period. This period is broken down into three phases. The early pre-dynastic, the middle pre-dynastic, and the late pre-dynastic. 
and it is during the middle pre-dynastic that we see the hallmarks of Egyptians' large population centers develop. This period lasted from 3500 BC to 3100 BC. Pay close attention to these dates, as we will come back to them, when comparing them with the first significant settlements in Mesopotamia. The middle pre-dynastic is also known as the Gerzian phase, named for Darb el Gerza on the Nile to the east of Fayum in Lower Egypt. It is also known as the Nakata II phase for similar sites in Upper Egypt, once again found around Nakata. Of particular importance is a Gerzian religious structure, a temple, found at Hierakonpolis, which had early examples of Egyptian tomb painting. Pottery from this phase is often decorated with depictions of birds and animals, as well as more abstract symbols for gods. The tombs are often quite substantial, with several chambers built out of mud bricks. The late pre-dynastic, which blends into the first dynastic period, is also known as the proto-dynastic phase. Egypt's population had grown considerably, and there were substantial communities along the Nile, which were politically and economically aware of each other. Goods were exchanged and a common language was spoken. It was during this phase that the process of wider political agglomeration began. Archaeologists keep pushing back the date as more discoveries are made, and the more successful communities extended their spheres of influence to include nearby settlements. The process led to the development of two distinct kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt, the Nile Valley and Nile Delta areas respectively. While it is true that archaeologists have found that settlements in Mesopotamia did back to 4000 BC, there are two clearly indicating items that when combined went to larger and earlier settlements existing in Kemet. The first one being that the Africans extensively used mud bricks for construction. Some of them are still being unearthed, like these ones in Duki Gel. And the second most important, which points to a very large population back in 8000 BC, is Napta Playa. Napta Playa alone shows that Africans already had large population concentration along the Nile because one cannot build such a large and mathematically precise cosmological observatory without specialization. And specialization arises out of layers and layers of sedentary and agriculturally backed social structures. Just to build Napta Playa alone, you need astronomers, you need mathematicians, you need the priest class, you need a large workforce, you need an agricultural system producing enough food so that people have enough time and energy to dispense on such a project, and you need the social structures to allow for coordinated effort to start and complete this project. It also shows that well into the 8th millennium BC, Africans had already started the long process of observing the celestial movement. And this would have happened for the period spanning at least a few centuries before Napta Playa was built. And this is another one of those archaeological discoveries that are seldom covered. So we can see that millennia before urban centers started sprawling up in Mesopotamia, Kemet, the Nubio-Kemetic civilization complex, was already very populated and very sophisticated, is sophistication that grew, and the population that grew, reaching an inflection point in 3500 BC in the middle and late pre-dynastic period where these artifacts and monuments show up in increasing frequency in a pretty much complete Egyptian civilization by 3100 BC when King Narmer, from Sudan, unified Upper and Lower Egypt. As more and more Africans gathered in Kemet, and as their population centers grew considerably, before they started writing down the names of their kings, queens, and gods, Kemetu showed mastery in another science well before the Sumerians. As early as 4800 BC, the Africans from the Nubio-Kemetic civilization had a functioning calendar. This is no surprise given the fact that they already built Napta Playa 3000 years earlier. This means that the Egyptians had already acquired a large portfolio of math skills. In fact, it's not until 2600 BC that Mesopotamia starts showing signs of advanced maths with their base 60 number, 60 minutes hours, and their 360 degrees geometry. But notice that 2600 BC was when the Africans were already building pyramids, showing mastery of numeracy, arithmetics, geometry, trigonometry, fractions, and they went as far as inventing algebra. 
There are so many firsts in mathematics from the Africans in Kemet that covering it here would make it a two-hour video. If you want more details on the true history of mathematics, check the link in the description. The Egyptians had a calendar as early as 4800 BC, but in 4200 BC their mathematics and astronomy produced a 365-day calendar, 12 months of 30 days plus 5 feast days. As we mentioned before, by 3100 BC, the time of the Egyptian mace, various agricultural communities along the banks of the Nile were united by a Nubian, Menes also called Narmer, who founded a dynasty of 32 pharaohs and lasted for the next 3,000 years. For more than half that time, Egypt included parts of modern Israel and Syria, as well as the Nile Valley. This is an important point to note. Today the populations living in those areas have very few individuals who look African. But back then the western part of the Levant was in great part populated by Africans, and more importantly ruled by Africans. Often when historians cite events from that region, this fact is ignored. To rule effectively, an efficient and extensive administration was developed by the Africans for taking taxes, census, and maintaining a large army. All of this required some mathematics. At first they used counting glyphs, but even by 2000 BC, the hieratic glyphs were in use. For information on sources, see Egyptian mathematical papyri. And here too, we see how the propagation of knowledge and know-how came from the south northward. This doesn't mean that the Levantine were lesser humans, incapable of inventions. Far from that. In fact, Mesopotamian math went on to introduce very useful concepts that we have covered, but also they introduced the decimal system, which was much better than the fractional system used by the Egyptians. But with all this, there is a better way to determine where the true origin of civilization was. I think the best way to show where the real cradle of civilization is to list out all the items that were first done or created by the Africans in the nubio kemetic Civilization Complex. Pay attention. Community banking, police, medicine, including anatomy, surgery, and diagnosis of many diseases from cancer to diabetes, needles, paved roads, scissors, writing paper, postal system, law, encryption, keys dams, F-ortresses, horse saddle, toothpaste, denture and dentistry, zoos, military organization, catapult, women hygienic cloths, birth control, mathematics including PI, zero, negative numbers, fractions, quadratic equations, exponentiations, binary calculations, base 10 numeral system, square root, mathematical symbols, conventions, and much more. Mercury, units and standards of measurements. Maps, astronomy, calendars, including the 365-day calendar and a leap year, architecture columns and pylons, cavettos, lever, large-scale buildings, gardens, corbel arch, makeup, tapestry, synthetic pigmentation, Olympic Games. It was called Hebsed. The Greeks copied it and renamed it the Olympic Games. Many of the sports we have today, including bowling, hockey, handball, gymnastic, weightlifting, high jump, fencing, wrestling, marathon, and so many more, Frying and cooking, foie gras, biscuits, cheese, umbrellas, high arpen shirt, high gel, gloves, perfume, flip-flops, high R extensions, hair dye, wine monotheism, schools, organized labor, sick leave, strike action, king lists, pens and ink, calendars, watches to tell time, high heels, tobacco and pipes, pest control, log books. The list is in fact so long that I had to edit out many minor inventions and discoveries, but I think you get the pictures. In no way can Mesopotamia be considered the cradle of civilization. It is not only a stretch, it is an insult to the truth. A truth that has been for far too long denied. Even in religion you will see that the Sumerians didn't invent much. Their religious framework comes from the Africans in Kemet. Two most popular gods of Mesopotamia are Anu and Ara. This is very interesting because these correspond directly to the ancient Egyptian gods Ani and Ra. Furthermore, the earliest known theory pertaining to the location of the soul is thought to come from ancient Egypt during the 3rd millennium BCE. Ancient Egyptian civilizations held the belief that the soul was composed of several parts. The Ba, Ka, 
Ren, Shoot, and the Ib. Furthermore, the Ib was located in the heart and considered the vital force that brought human beings to life. Because the Ib was also responsible for thoughts and feelings, its status determined a person's fate upon their death. This took place during a heart-weighing ceremony in which Anubis would feed the heaviest hearts to the demon Amit. It is believed that the ancient Egyptian view of the heart formed the foundation for later theories on the location for the human soul. In Mesopotamian conceptions of the afterlife, life did not end after physical death, but continued in the form of an etemu, a spirit or ghost dwelling in the netherworld. Further, physical death did not sever the relationship between living and deceased, but reinforced their bond through a new set of mutual obligations. You can see how both of these concepts of afterlife are very similar. In a sense, the pyramids themselves are said to be the representation of a vessel, a ship, that will carry and protect the pharaoh through space, time, and through dimensions towards the afterlife. And this also explains the fascination for Egyptians to maintain the body through time via mummification. Mummification that we have seen comes from Western Sahara when it was still lush and populated by black people. These salient concepts are well described by Dr. Kaitezua Luyaluka when he links ancient Kemetu religion and Sumerian religion to ATR, African traditional religions. These religions differ from the Western model of religion in that they are in reality exact sciences. Central African religion from the Congo shows that it is a continuation of the solar scientific religion practiced in Kemet and Sumer. When one studies the mythologies and historical texts from Kemet and Sumer, we quickly find that the astral bodies and the unseen fabric of the universe are all present, unlike Western religions that depend on the materiality of the physical. African traditional religions was in fact the source of Kemetic and Sumerian religion before the Western materialism and distortion of Darwinism applied to religion erroneously relegated ATR to a backward stance. And yet, it was the originator and a veneration of science, as Dr. Kiatezua shows. Furthermore, the Mesopotamian had a pantheon of gods that represented different aspects of nature and of humanity. These concepts are directly taken from the ancient nubio kemetic civilization complex, where a pretty much full set of complements of these gods are present back in 3100 BC. They do evolve over time, to culminate into the Amana era monotheism, when Akhenaten recognized the one and only true God as Amun-Ra, from which all Abrahamic religion befall, intact with pretty much all its tenets, from the Ten Commandments to the fasting. The preeminent deity in this category is Atom. According to the myth, Atom emerged from the nun, effectively differentiating himself from the pre-created state and instigating the process of creation. This event marked the transition from the pre-created world, governed by the Eight, to the created world, under the auspices of the Nine, thereby bringing into existence the world as known in the Heliopolitan tradition. We have seen how the Africans from Kemet preceded the Mesopotamians in writing, and we even saw how in religion the Mesopotamians took their inspirations from the Africans. Although it may be uncomfortable to admit today that black people were the ones to light the spark of civilization, it doesn't make it less true. The unfortunate truth is that in this realization lies the answer to many of our modern ills. The Afro-descendants community has suffered for far too long from this artificially induced view that they are incapable of civilization building and technology. And yet, history tells us otherwise. History also provides a template that shows that we could have much greater economic output and innovation if the full potential of human capacity was used. Instead of creating division along lines of melanin concentration, we could have not so much as a utopia, but a world where we are all better off. Unfortunately, we are left with a world where ignorance and lies lead to fear, hatred, where obviously despicable acts are now justified and sanctioned under the assumption that all black people are not deserving of a chance, let alone of kindness. This in turn creates a vicious cycle where people of color, specifically black youth, 
excluded from the economy, preyed upon by the system from policing to prison to media, who benefit from their malfortune, this black youth, just like youth anywhere without jobs and option, have no option but to opt for whatever is left to help them survive. And with these come bad practices and habits. Oh yes, before I leave you, I do want to go over the identity of the population that brought the foundations of the Sumerian civilization. Here are two extracts from both John D. Baldwin and Dr. Rashidi on the matter. Ancient Sumer, the biblical land of Shinar, modern Lower Mesopotamia, flourished in the 3rd millennium BC, covering the territorial expanse of the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. Embracing the shores of the Persian Gulf, Sumer extended north to Akkad, a distance of about 320 miles, thus constituting southern Babylonia. The appellation Chaldea, frequently applied to the region, appears to have been introduced by the Assyrians in the 9th century BC. The designations Babylon, Babylonia, and Chaldea have been used extensively, particularly by 19th century scholars, in reference to the area now almost exclusively known as Sumer. Sumer appears to be the first major high culture of Western Asia. She bequeathed to her successor states a tradition of great achievement. Her many contributions to civilization are well known, Brilliant agriculturalists, the Sumerians built very sophisticated canals and reservoirs to irrigate their fields. They possessed both an advanced legal system and a well-developed knowledge of medicine, and were perhaps the ancient world's greatest astronomers. While these salient facts regarding Sumer's obvious cultural genius are well known, the important question of the racial composition of its population is generally glossed over. This apparent cloud concerning race, however, is very thin, and there is a substantial body of evidence in support of the position that the civilization of Sumer was the product of black migrations from Africa's Nile Valley. This is not to argue that ancient Sumer was exclusively peopled by blacks, or that the Africans were the only early ethnic entity in the area. Sumer was at the crossroads of Asia, Africa, and Europe, and over the millennia there was a great deal of foreign intrusions and racial intermingling. In respect to Sumerian civilization, however, the black contribution was decisive and far overshadowed that of the later invaders. I would also like to quote John D. Baldwin in his book, Prehistoric Nations. It is now admitted that a people of the Kushite or Ethiopian race, sometimes called Hamites, were the first civilizers and builders throughout Western Asia, and they are traced by the remains of their language, their architecture, and the influence of their civilization on both shores of the Mediterranean, in Eastern Africa and the Nile Valley, in Hindustan, and in the islands of the Indian Seas. These conclusions clearly show that civilization and technology originated south, from the interior of the African continent, well before the tragedy of the drying up of the Sahara. Civilization then migrated north of the Nile before spreading towards the Levant. And all archaeological records show this. Special shout out to these supporters for their amazing support. Carol Asbaram, Kawana Blake, Mike Wilson, John L. Chevalier, Oscar Hubbard, Paulo Othello, Van Anderson, Birdian Chantawong, Prince Parker, Marie, Leonade, Boss Gaddafi, Maria, Morgan, Lee DeQueer, Maurice Anderson. These and everyone who has ever donated to Without History through any medium, YouTube, Patreon, Crypto, or Buy Me a Coffee, you are all heroes of humanity.
No truer words have been spoken. History is not a burden on the memory, but an illumination of the soul. Join us and see how those who are said to be without history birthed civilization itself. <laughs> 